Welcome to the Sad Crime Channel. Today I would like to introduce you to a case that shocked public opinion in Australia in 2009. I invite you to listen to the story of the Lin family. Min Lin was originally from China but moved to Sydney to study there. In that city he met a young woman named Lily who came from the same country as him. Young people started dating and after some time they got married. Soon their first child was born, a girl named Brenda. Three years later, their first son, Henry, was born, and after another three years, they welcomed into the world a second son, Terry. Min and Lily owned a newspaper store where they worked seven days a week. They realized that if they wanted to achieve something in Australia, they had to work as hard as they could. They themselves came from rather poor homes, and their dream was to provide their children with the education at the highest possible level. They wanted their children to have everything that they were not provided for as children. Their hard work soon began to pay off. The Lynn couple was well liked by the local community. The store prospered more and more, and with the money they earned in it, they were able to buy themselves a house on the outskirts of Sydney in New Epping. In addition to the entire family of five, the house also was occupied by Irene, Lily's younger sister, who, like Lily, worked part-time in their store. The Lynn family was doing better and better, and after a while they were able to afford to buy another house located in Marylands, a half-hour drive from their home. It was occupied by Min's parents, who had moved to Australia to be closer to their children, because besides Min, his sister Kathy and her husband Robert also emigrated to that country. Kathy and her husband Robert initially settled in Melbourne, where they opened a restaurant. However, they had problems bringing in chefs from China and eventually the restaurant turned out not to be as profitable as they had assumed, so they were forced to close it. After this failure, Kathy moved to the outskirts of Sydney with her husband and their son, where she settled closer to her brother. They settled on the same street where Min lived with his family, just 300 meters from their home. Kathy was another member of Lynn's family who found employment in her brother's store. Min and Kathy's families were very close to each other, they spent a lot of time together and cared about each other. Every spare moment, Robert taught Henry to play badminton, which was his favorite sport, and every Friday they all went to his grandparents' house, where a family dinner was held. July 17, 2009 was no different. Everyone showed up at the house in Marylands except Brenda, who was away on a school trip. The 15-year-old, who was studying French at school, went with other students on a week-long trip to New Caledonia, an island where the official language is French. There, among the local community, young people were to have the opportunity to practice the language. On Monday, July 13th, early in the morning, Min drove his daughter to the airport. There was no tender farewell. As a rebellious teenager, Brenda found it embarrassing to hug her father or kiss him goodbye in front of her classmates. She only dropped a few words to say goodbye. Brenda felt that the situation was a bit awkward, but after all, she's only leaving for a week. She'll be back before they know it. Friday family evening passed in a pleasant atmosphere. The grandparents wanted their grandson Henry to stay with them for the night, but the 12-year-old had a badminton game scheduled for the next day and didn't want to miss it. After a pleasantly spent evening, everyone returned to their homes. The next day, first thing in the morning, Kathy began receiving phone calls from concerned customers of the store. They all called asking when the store would be open. It had never happened before that it was closed for no reason at all, especially on a Saturday when the store's traffic was busiest. Since Kathy couldn't get through to her brother, she became concerned and decided that she had to see what was going on herself. She asked her husband, who was just cleaning out the garage, to go with her to Min's house. When they arrived at the site, it was about 9 a.m. The first thing that worried Kathy and Robert was the door not being locked. Kathy called out the name of her brother and sister-in-law, but no one answered. They went inside. The house looked as it always did, but the occupants were nowhere to be seen. No one answered her call, so Kathy decided to check the bedrooms, located on the second floor. She first went to Min and Lily's bedroom. A horrifying sight appeared to her eyes. There was blood everywhere on the walls, the floor, and on the bed where Lily was lying. Terrified, Kathy ran to the next bedroom where Irene always spent the night. There she was left with the same sight. Lily's sister was lying on the bed covered in blood. 
Robert asked Kathy not to look further, however, she had to check on the children. She skipped Brenda's room because she knew the girl was on a trip, but she had to check on the boys, 12-year-old Henry and 9-year-old Terry. Unfortunately, the attacker did not spare them. Both were lying on the floor, bloodied. Kathy, along with her husband, got out of the house with all her might and called the emergency number. She was so terrified that she struggled to explain to the operator what she had just seen. She was not sure whether her relatives were alive or had been killed. As she tried in a shaking voice to convey all the relevant information, Robert decided that he had to inform his wife's parents. He called them first, asking only that they come on the first possible train. He did not tell them what had happened. Eventually, however, he decided that he would go to pick them up. Kathy begged him not to leave her alone, but he did not listen to her. Hello, I need an ambulance to 55A Boundary Road. What's up, So it's 55A Boundary Road, Epping North, and it's a house? Yeah, yeah. What's the problem? Yeah, the house, what's yeah. What, what's wrong? What's wrong? I'm not sure someone, I think she didn't see me. I think she didn't, I'm not sure. You, you need to tell me why you need an ambulance. What's wrong? Yeah, I think someone died. I'm not sure. Why do you think someone's dying? <laughs> you need to tell me something. You're asking for an ambulance, but why? Yeah, I also need a place to yeah, Why? What's wrong? <laughs> what is wrong? Don't scream. Just <laughs> answer my question. Yeah, I mean, because I'm supposed to be killed. I'm is someone sure bleeding? Is someone unconscious? I think so they die. Why? Why? I'm not sure that maybe someone killed my my um, my brother's family. Oh. I need someone to come quick. Yeah, we are coming. You need to stop screaming and tell me what the problem is. Someone killed my brother's family. Why do you think that? Yeah, because I went to his, his house and uh, I knocked the door and the door is um, just closed and open. Uh, and I'm just trying to find my brother. I couldn't find him. I'm not sure. Where's your brother? Are they on the ground? No, 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 they are the bedroom, they are all the bedroom. Are they, are they in the house? Is your brother in the house? I'm not sure. <laughs> have you found, have, we are driving there. Answer my questions, please. Have you found no, a body? I'm, I'm at, at my brother's home. Have you found a body? Just quick. We are driving there. Don't say quick. Tell me what's wrong. Have you seen your brother? I'm not sure. No, it's yes or no. Can you see no, him? I, I, no. Is I he in the house? Brother. Can you see their bodies? Yeah, I saw. Police officers who arrived on the scene found Kathy waiting in front of the house. They didn't know what to expect. It was not entirely clear from the report whether someone had been killed or was just injured. They had no idea if it was one person or if there were more victims. They were not prepared for what they saw inside. Some even experienced police officers had not dealt with this type of crime before. Lily, Irene, Henry, and Terry were hit repeatedly with some kind of heavy object. The women were startled in their sleep while Henry and Terry managed to wake up before the assault. This was to be evidenced by the blood stains that were all over the walls. They must have moved around the room in an attempt to escape the attacker. There was no trace of men anywhere, and police officers began to suspect that he might be responsible for carrying out the crimes. Kathy, however, could not believe that her brother would be capable of such a thing. And she asked the police officers to check again. Perhaps he's somewhere in the bedroom under the bedspread. And that's where they managed to find the body of Min, who, like the other four, had been murdered by delivering multiple blows with a heavy object. These blows were aimed mainly at the head and face, which made him difficult to recognize, just like the other four. Meanwhile, the unsuspecting Brenda was enjoying the last days of her trip. She and her friends decided to go on Facebook to check on their friends who were staying in Australia. Her friends, who were not with them on the trip, were also curious to see how their trip was going. Brenda, along with her friends, wanted to tell them about their adventures, but to Brenda's surprise, everyone started asking her how she was feeling. She didn't know what it was about, why the concern. One of her friends sent her a link to an article, accompanied by a photo of Brenda's house, in which the girl could read about the tragic events. She read the article, but was unable to believe what was written. She took the first possible plane back to Sydney, 
where Kathy picked her up at the airport. It wasn't until the expression on her aunt's face that she realized this wasn't some silly joke. It had really happened. Since Brenda was only 15, she couldn't live alone. Someone adult had to take care of her. And then Robert offered that Brenda could live with him, Kathy, and their son. It seemed pretty obvious. They were, besides her grandparents, the closest family the girl had left. And given that they lived only a few hundred meters from Brenda's family home, she stayed in the same neighborhood, which meant she didn't have to change school. Kathy and Robert took care of the grieving girl and took care of running the store that had previously belonged to her parents. The investigating police officers took a close look at the crime scene. There were no signs of forced entry, so clearly the murderer must have had his own key. Everything pointed to the fact that the crime was committed by a person who knew Lynn's family. He knew the layout of their house and knew that the eldest daughter would not be home that night. Brenda's room was the only one in perfect condition. There were no traces of blood on the doorknob, as if the attacker knew that he didn't need to look in that room because no one was there. Twenty-four bloody shoe prints were found on the floor throughout the house, all of the same type. No other footprints were found, which meant that the perpetrator was alone. The footprints found belonged to Asics brand athletic shoes in size 8.5 to 10.5. They matched only three shoe models in the brand. None of them had been manufactured since 2005. Nothing was missing from the house, so police officers were able to rule out that something had gone wrong during the burglary. Besides, it was immediately apparent that the burglary was not the issue. The killings were carried out with such force, so many blows were inflicted, that investigators guessed that the killer must have had something to do with the victims, had an emotional attachment to them. Kathy and Robert were questioned, however. Neither of them had any idea who might have wanted Min and the rest of his family dead. Min was a very friendly man. He seemed to have no enemies. Kathy and Robert's testimony did not help the investigators in any way. They kept wondering what the motive for the crimes could have been. Who could have wanted the death of such a peaceful family that did not bother anyone? Investigators also did not know if Brenda, as the only survivor of the family, was safe. Is she still in danger, and could she become another victim of this killer? There were many questions and no answers. After some time, it came to light that less than two months before his death, at the end of May, Min had witnessed a burglary that took place near his store. Suspicions then arose that perhaps the burglars wanted to eliminate an inconvenient witness. However, after checking this lead, it turned out that there were no connections. This lead led nowhere. Investigators began to focus more on what they had suspected all along. The killer had to be someone from the family or friends, someone who knew where to find a spare key or was in possession of one himself, someone who, despite the fact that he had disconnected the electricity in the entire house, was able to move around the house without a problem, someone who knew that Brenda's room would be empty that night because she was away from home, someone who hated men so much that he inflicted so many blows on him that it was difficult to recognize him. In early 2010, Investigators began to take a closer look at Robert, Kathy's husband. His behavior seemed suspicious. On the recording of Kathy's conversation with the emergency number operator, she can clearly be heard shouting something to her husband in their native language. When the words were translated, it appeared that Kathy was begging him not to leave her alone, which seemed obvious, since at that point they were unsure whether the attacker had left the house. He could have been staying somewhere inside all the time. Despite this, Robert left his terrified wife at the scene and went to his in-law's house on his own. Another suspicious thing that investigators pointed out was that Robert, who was a doctor by profession and who had worked in that profession before emigrating to Australia, didn't even check whether the victims were still alive or whether they needed to be given first aid. Robert's behavior sometime after the murders was also strange. He and Kathy had taken on the running of a store previously owned by Min, but also managed his properties. And then Robert evicted his in-laws from their home in Maryland. The old people were forced to leave this house and had to quickly look for a replacement property. What was the purpose of such behavior? Robert, however, had an alibi for that night. 
He and his wife, after returning from dinner at his in-law's house, watched TV until about 2 a.m., then went to bed. Kathy confirmed his words. Robert himself did not leave the house even for a moment that night. Investigators suspected him, however. They had no evidence to prove it. Therefore, they decided to install cameras in their house. Of course, Kathy and Robert were not informed of this fact. In May 2010, Kathy was questioned again. And that's when investigators began asking her about the shoes her husband was wearing. They knew that he owned a pair of that very model of ASIC shoes, the sole of which matched the shoe prints left at the crime scene. They informed Kathy of the 24 footprints found in her brother's house. And it wasn't long after the interrogation that police officers noticed on the footage at the suspect's home that he was cutting a shoe box into small pieces. He soaks them in water, then flushes everything down the toilet. Upon closer inspection of the footage, they noticed that the box was actually of A6 shoes in size nine and a half. Investigators obtained permission to search Kathy and Robert's home. The entire house was searched, especially the garage, which Robert was cleaning on the morning of July 18, 2009, the day the Lynn family's bodies were found. In the garage, 
A small stain that resembled a blood stain was found on the concrete under the chest of drawers. It was sampled for testing and sent to a laboratory in the United States. At the time, the Australians did not have as good equipment as their counterparts in the States, and they knew that Americans could get more information from the sample. There was a bit of a wait for the results, but it was worth it. The results they obtained were what the investigators had been waiting for for so many months. The sample taken from Robert's garage contained DNA from four of the five victims. Robert Z was arrested in May 2011. However, he did not admit to committing the crime. He insisted all along that he was innocent. Kathy could not believe that her husband could be responsible for committing this crime. There must have been some misunderstanding. Also, Brenda, who lived under his roof all the time, was convinced of her uncle's innocence. Investigators tried to gather as much evidence as possible against Robert and persuaded a man who shared a cell with him to cooperate. He was to gain Robert's trust, then try to extract as much information as possible from him about the crime. And indeed, after some time spent in the same cell, Robert began to talk. He talked about how he had given his wife sleeping pills so that she wouldn't wake up and notice that he had left the house. He also told about where he bought the hammer that was used as the murder weapon. Robert knew that in one of the stores where such tools can be purchased, there is no monitoring. And it was in this store that he made the purchase. He hid the hammer well, but could access it at any time. He also boasted that as a doctor, he had knowledge of how to cause a person to lose consciousness by applying pressure in the right place. And he put that knowledge to use by killing his wife's family. Robert did not want to be the person to find the bodies of the murdered because that could have put him in the circle of suspects. However, he had no control over the development of the situation. He could not suspect that customers would start calling his wife in the morning and that he would have to go with her to her brother's house. Not all of the conversations between Robert and this fellow inmate could be recorded and some of the testimonies were just this inmate's words against Robert's. According to the prosecutor, the motive for this crime could have been Robert's jealousy over his brother-in-law's much better adaptation after moving to a new country. While still living in China, Robert himself practiced a profession that earned respect from others. Upon arriving in Australia, he tried his luck by opening a restaurant, but it turned out to be a failure. After moving from Melbourne to Sydney in 2006, Robert had no steady job. His father-in-law constantly reminded him of this. He constantly felt like he was being compared to men who had succeeded. But jealousy wasn't the only reason he decided to take such a drastic step. The second motive came to light during the trial when Brenda testified. It was only then that she dared to tell the truth about Robert. It turned out that he was obsessed with her. Even before the murders, there were incidents where he touched Brenda inappropriately. Kathy's father testified in court that when he once stayed overnight at his daughter's house, he got up in the night to use the bathroom and noticed Robert standing over Brenda's sleeping bed. The man was very upset to be noticed. His obsession with Brenda would explain why she was the only survivor. When she was the only survivor, it was logical for her to go to the house of the closest relatives. Robert still had to eliminate his in-laws from the game, so Brenda wouldn't want to live with them by any chance. That's why he deprived them of shelter. He had everything he wanted then. Brenda, who was within reach, and a thriving business taken over from his brother-in-law. Robert was no longer the failure everyone thought he was. Brenda's testimonies shed new light on the case and led to the trial being interrupted. Robert Aziz's trial was restarted four times for various reasons. Throughout this time, Robert tried to obtain the opportunity for bail, but each time his request was rejected. Only after four years and seven months spent in custody did Robert obtain permission to leave the prison walls on bail in December 2015. He was then under constant surveillance, had to report to the police station three times a day, and electronic monitoring was also applied to him. I, I can see everywhere it was red. Red, red, and um, everywhere. Uh, I first see it is, uh, uh, I think it's red. 
I I think I saw my sister in law first. 我睇到之後，我即刻就攬住 case， 我 case， 我老婆好睇，好睇。Um, once I saw her, I I I hold Kathy and I said, Kathy, don't don't look at it. 但係我相信 Kathy 都睇到啦。But I believe Kathy had already seen. 然後喺喺牀嘅靠呢一邊咧。應該係一團，我估應我我認為係佢哥嚟嘅。嗯、um, ，and I saw that、um, the b e s t side，、uh, which is close to the door，、mm. I saw this side，I saw a a a, a staff，、um, a group staff，I think it was her brother。亦都係，亦都係。Like a pile. Yeah, yeah, a pile. Yeah, yeah. Because I, 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 I but I just feel it was so red and、um, messy everywhere. No. No. Hey, I, I, we just walk out. Hey, I, 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 跑去誒、呃、另外嗰啲房間度。We ran, we ran to the other room。睇到誒樓梯過嚟，以前個屋地圖上 Terry 嗰個房係關住門嘅。I saw、um, the Terry's room. I indicate before、It、used to be Terry's room. The door was closed.、嗯 The door is closed. Irene, be tired of that one. Irene, yeah. Irene. Is closed. The door is closed. Should be um, should be push open the door. Um, we see Irene in the bedroom. We saw Irene on the bed. Hmm. Also, the floor is covered with many blood spots. Uh, also a lot of blood around, very red. Uh, I, I go to touch her. I want to touch her. 我因為我想知道佢係咪誒仲活住。I try to touch her. I I went closer. I try to touch her. 因為我 Because I want to know whether she was still alive. 因為我覺得佢唔佢當時我睇到佢唔係完全平攤喺床上嘅。Because I when I saw her, she was not just lie down on the bed flatly. 所以我想試一試。So I want to try。不過 Kathy 拉住我。But um Kathy uh hold me back。所以我好可能係冇掂到佢嘅。So I think I did not touch actually touch touch her。然後我哋又出翻嚟。Then we came out again、嗯。再去到最後嗰個房間。We reached the last bedroom. Uh, 就係地圖上亨利嗰個房間。Um, that's Henry's bedroom. I indicate on the map. 嗰個門係好似未完全關曬。Um, the 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 door was half closed. 
好 sure 啊。嗯 ，I'm not sure。然後我哋入咗去睇。We enter the room。同樣都係一眼睇到係兩個細路仔喺地下度。Or we can see、uh, both children、uh, were lying on the floor。亦都係覺得。好多血，可能好好紅嘅。Yeah, also feel very red,、yeah. blood all around。啊，好亂嘅感覺。Messy。啊，然後我又係好想去摸下佢哋，睇下佢哋係咪仲活住，因為兩個細路仔。I again, I want to touch them. Uh, because they are just little kids,、um, I really want to know whether they are still alive or not. I remember I tried to reach them by my right hand. I really can't remember. But I can't remember. Then I think I guess lying on me, I go, I go, I go. Kathy, um. Held me back and she kept. 一路叫，好驚咁一路大聲叫。She kept yelling, "Let's go, let's go!" She was so frightening. 當然我都好 frightened. I I was afraid as well. In June 2016, the fourth and final trial of Robert began. In January 2017, the jury reached a verdict agreement. Robert Z was found guilty of committing these crimes. For each of the murders committed, he received a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He will never be released. Robert appealed against this sentence, which was rejected in February same year. Kathy still believes in her husband's innocence. She believes that Robert was convicted of crimes committed by someone else. Police accused her that Robert must have given her information about where Min's body was. No one could find him for four hours. Only after she said to check under the quilt, they found his body. However, Kathy denied that Robert gave her this information. It was just her intuition. Her parents have a completely different opinion about Robert. They consider their son-in-law a monster, whose jealousy and fascination with Brenda blinded him to such an extent that he took the lives of five innocent people. Brenda Lynn only gave an interview eight years after the murders, in which she talked about the events of that period. She revealed then that she was being molested by Robert. Previously, during the trial, it was not disclosed that it was her. After she moved into Kathy and Robert's house, the situations only intensified. Since the family was murdered, Brenda has graduated from university, obtained her driver's license. However, She has no one to share these joyful moments with. She's alone in this world. To this day, she regrets not saying goodbye to her dad that morning at the airport. She didn't hug him and didn't tell him how much she loved him. Now there is no such possibility.